Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight. Arguments begin in the Attorney General's office appeal of the Frank Smith ruling. Three men were brought before the magistrate's court charged with that May 5th John Bull robbery. news is brought to you by Alive. Welcome to Our News and thanks for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. Topping news tonight after a nearly two-month delay in the Crown's appeal of Frank Smith's acquittal. Justices of the Court of Appeal heard substantive arguments from both the Crown and the former PLP Senator's legal team. The Crown tore into Chief Magistrate Joanne Ferguson Pratt's ruling while the defense defended it. At stake is the possibility of Smith facing another bribery and extortion trial. Jasmine Brown has more. Lawyers for both sides made their arguments today in a process that lasted for hours, taking up much of the day. Hearing the prosecution's challenge to Frank Smith's acquittal on charges of bribery and extortion were justices of appeal John Isaacs, Stella Crane Scott, and Roy Jones. Chief Magistrate Joanne Ferguson Pratt on February 1st acquitted Smith on allegations that he extorted $60,000 from public hospital authority contractor Barbara Hanna after he allegedly assisted her in getting a half a million dollar contract to clean the critical care unit at Princess Margaret Hospital. The Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions appealed the decision to accept no case submissions at the close of the prosecution's case. During his nearly three-hour submission in court on Tuesday morning, DPP Garvin Gaskin picked apart Ferguson Pratt's ruling based on several grounds. The DPP said Ferguson Pratt's decision to dismiss the case was flawed as he maintained elements of the offenses were met evidentially. He also argued the chief magistrate took extraneous matters into consideration and that she was speculative, which he said indicated her consideration demonstrated the danger danger and irregularity of her decision. Gaskin also argued against the chief magistrate's findings in her ruling that star prosecution witness Hannah was untruthful and evasive on the stand. The DPP insisted the prosecution found those findings inconsistent, as they said Hannah always maintained on the stand that money was demanded and paid. Gaskin also told the court that Ferguson Pratt improperly admitted evidence into the case, including a job letter for Hannah's son, Adrian, who was not even a witness in the case. As for Ferguson Pratt's claim that there was not a scintilla of evidence to show Hannah met with Smith before the contract was awarded by the PHA board, Gaskin said there was clear evidence to prove the pair met before that time. When it came to the legality of Ferguson Pratt's ruling, Gaskin argued that her findings were made contrary to law and that she inserted her beliefs into her ruling when he said a magistrate should be as clinical as possible. Gaskin also accused Ferguson Pratt of making inappropriate comments in her ruling. He said her comments concerning the case being high profile were inappropriate and better left unsaid. The DPP summed up by calling for the appeal to be allowed and the case sent back to the magistrate's court before a different magistrate. But Smith's Jamaican attorney Katie Knight QC saw it much differently as he argued against the Crown's claims saying he supported the magistrate's ruling being upheld and the appeal dismissed. Knight maintained Ferguson Pratt exercised her jurisdiction correctly as he said it was her job to assess the evidence and the credibility of the witness. Knight is expected to continue his submissions on Wednesday morning. Smith was also represented by attorneys Damian Gomez QC and Philip McKinsey. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Well, one week after robbers smashed glass cases at John Mull's Bahamar location and fled with nearly half a million dollars worth of jewelry, three men were charged in the magistrate's court. Jillian Gray has more. Three men were brought before the magistrate's court charged with that snatch-and-grab robbery that happened on May 5th at John Bull Bahamar. 33-year-old Jason Ferguson in the black jacket, 24-year-old Diego Carey in the tropical pants shorts, and 22-year-old Frenage Wright in the black shirt and blue jeans were all charged with one count of stealing and one count of causing harm. 
It's alleged that on May 5th, the trio stole $451,625 worth of jewelry, diamonds and watches from John Bull and caused nearly $40,000 worth of damage when they allegedly smashed two glass showcases and one glass counter. Carrie and Wright pled not guilty to the charges and will return to court on July 1st and 2nd. However, Ferguson pled guilty to the charges. The prosecutor, while reading the summary of facts, told the court that on Sunday, May 5th, at 3.15 p.m., officers responded to reports of an alleged robbery at John Bull located at Bahamar. The store's manager allegedly told officers that a male wearing dark shades entered the store, banged on the glass, grabbed Rolex watches, and ran out the store. Witnesses in the store at the time told officers that two men also grabbed jewelry. When Ferguson was arrested and questioned, he allegedly confessed to the offense, telling officers that he was approached by a man who said he had a job for him to do. The court heard that he and the male cased the property in a black Honda on May 1st. When they returned on May 5th in a gold Ford Explorer, Ferguson allegedly said the two men entered the store while he remained in the car. He later directed officers to the said vehicle, which had been caught on camera. The magistrate told Ferguson that the maximum amount of years for his offense was seven years and asked him to state why he should not face that maximum penalty. As Ferguson pleaded with the court for mercy, he became tearful, telling the court he had a seven-year-old daughter he needed to take care of. He said he had been out of work for a long time due to a rare skin condition. He claimed he would get hired at an establishment, but when the condition flares up, up, he would get fired because of the smell and sight of the rashes on his skin. He also told the court that he would accept the consequences of his actions, but would like to return to his family as soon as possible. Magistrate Samuel McKinney told Ferguson that he appreciates him not wasting the court's time by pleading guilty. He, however, said the charge is very serious, as none of the nearly half a million dollars worth of goods were recovered. He then gave Ferguson four years on count one and one year on count two to run concurrently. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. Meanwhile, three men were charged in the magistrate's court in connection with that double murder on part of Skidok. 30-year-old Ramon Young in the blue shirt and 25-year-old Deshaun Brooks in the gray jacket were charged with two counts of murder, while Dominic Johnson was charged with two counts of abetment to murder. It is alleged that on May 8th, while at part of Skidok, Young and Brooks, being concerned together, caused the death of Lothario Lockhart and Merrick Russell. According to police, officers responded to reports of gunshots fired in Potosky Dock around 9 p.m. When they arrived, they found two men unresponsive with gunshot wounds to the body. The three men were not required to enter a plea and will return to court on June 20th. In other news, the deputy prime minister is labeling as reckless and dangerous and unreasonable attorney Fred Smith's assertion that government should allow undocumented migrants to work instead of spending millions to detain them. Turnquist says he finds it amazing that the human rights activists could even make such statements. With more on this, here's Giorgio Bain. Following comments by local human rights activist Frank Smith stated that undocumented migrants should not be detained and allowed to work, Deputy Prime Minister Peter Turnquist is now calling those comments reckless and dangerous. During a hearing on the treatment of migrants in the Bahamas, which took place on Friday in Kingston, Jamaica, Smith called the detention of undocumented migrants illegal and said they should be allowed to work and contribute to society. Many Haitian migrants or those waiting for documentation can live and be constructive and productive members of the society instead of it costing the government hundreds of millions of dollars, as you say, to keep them in an illegal detention center. Let them out and let them work in the community. Deputy Prime Minister Peter Turnquist called those comments unreasonable and reckless. Any suggestion uh, that uh, we ought to just fling open the doors and every and anybody can come is inherently uh, uh, disadvantageous and uh, uh, dangerous, reckless uh, uh, to the Bahamian people. Uh, it is just, it's just, it amazes me, quite frankly, that somebody would, would make such a suggestion. It, it's just not reasonable. Despite Smith's assertion that the Bahamas is huge geographically, Turquoise said the country simply cannot absorb everyone. I saw a statement this morning by a, a, a um, constituent that said, um, we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% unemployment. How do we absorb uh, illegals into the workforce? Um, and if we, if we uh, pay them uh, low wages, there's another uh, implication and consequence of that. The fact of the matter is that we cannot absorb uh, any and everybody into this, in, into this uh, economy. Uh, we are a small nation. 
uh, our resources are limited. Reporting for our news, I'm Georgia Bain. Well, the finance minister also hit back at PLP deputy leader Chester Cooper, who called out the government after the economy failed to meet GDP growth projections. Last year, government predicted a 2.2 percent increase in gross domestic product for 2018. However, the Department of Statistics revealed a 1.6 percent increase. Cooper suggested the ill-advised VAT hike likely slowed economic growth. Well, here's how Turncrest responded to that. I note the critics, and the fact of the matter is that uh, they have no basis uh, for, for any criticism in this regard, uh, given the track record. Uh, and so it is somewhat uh, amusing uh, to hear the, the uh, opposition, um, um, Mr. Cooper, make the statements that he makes. Uh, because he has no legs to stand on in this, uh, in this argument. Um, again, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that we have had positive growth, we have had strong uh, economic performance, all indicators uh, indicate uh, a point towards a strengthening of the economy, uh, and that is the positive that needs to be taken uh, from this uh, uh, statistic. Cooper also demanded an explanation on why the growth projection was not met considering the opening of Bahamar, the booming U.S. economy, and record tourist arrivals, which he says the Minnesota administration had nothing to do with. He's right. If it wasn't for the upturn in tourism, that uh, our GDP growth would not uh, have advanced as, as, uh, as well as it has. Uh, but that is the structure and the makeup of our economy. But we are predominantly uh, um, uh, 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 driven uh, by tourism. 80% of our economy. And so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, 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 a you know, strange statement to make. Right? Uh, we would expect that any uh, gains in the tourism sector, or, sorry, in, in GDP would be led by tourism. That's just natural. Uh, and until we have some structural uh, change in the economy, that's the way it's going to be. Still to come, the Bahamas and U.S. governments work to reestablish an education program. Plus, Bahamar and Hendricks pair up for something unusual. Stay tuned.